Welcome to worship here with Whittier United Methodist Church and our sister church, Wesleyana UMC. Our scriptures this morning are Psalm 90, verses 1 through 6 and 13 through 17, and Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 through 46. So I invite you to pause this and go read those sections of scripture, Psalm 90, 1 through 6, 13 through 17, and Matthew 22, 34 through 46. And once you've done that, I invite you to join me in prayer. Would you pray with me? God, who has been our dwelling place in all generations, thank you for bringing us together in this time and in this place. By your spirit, make your presence known among us. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You know, whenever I read scripture passages like to one today, my first response, my first thought is that Jesus is asking us to do difficult things. Because to me, it really feels like he is asking us to do something hard. I don't know exactly how to follow Jesus when it comes to passages like today's. When I read teachings like this one in Matthew 22, I often feel a lot like this Play-Doh. I don't know what shape I'm supposed to be. I don't necessarily know what it is that I'm here for, what it looks like to follow Jesus in these situations. And I don't know if I am supposed to be the one loving out loud in every situation or if I am meant to be the one sitting back and praying. I don't know what God is calling me to do when God calls me to love. I feel like I have a crisis of identity. I don't know what I'm for. Maybe you feel that same way too, or maybe you don't. But luckily for all of us, Jesus doesn't start his teaching today with me or with any of us. He starts with God. He teaches us that the greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart and soul and mind. Now, you could preach 10 sermons just on what it means to love God with all of your heart and another 10 on what it means to love God with all of your soul and another 10 on what it means to love God with your mind. And each would be powerful, and each would be important. But I take a shortcut most of the time, because there are only so many sermons that you can preach on one Sunday. And so I say that we are to love God with all that we are. Instead of breaking it out into heart, mind, and soul, I say, love God with all that you are and all that you have. This means that every fiber of your being should be oriented toward God. Every part of us should always be looking toward God. But to be honest, that's hard too. What are we supposed to think about? when we think about God? What are we supposed to see when we look toward God? Are we supposed to see the first person of the Trinity, the person who Jesus called Father, the one that I sometimes call God the parent, the one that theologians call the source of life? Are we supposed to think about the big, great God who holds all of the world in his hands. Or maybe, as scripture says in other places, we should think about the mother bear, always ready to defend us, her young, from whatever attacks. Or maybe it's some mysterious something else, bigger than what we can understand something that 
takes up the whole sky, the whole universe in a shape that never quite makes sense to us, something that is beyond our knowing. But how are we supposed to love this? I mean, people over the centuries have tried to love this mysterious, unending aspect of God. Maybe it is the God, the storm God, the God of the whirlwind, the one that we see at the end of Job, or in some of the Psalms, the God who declares dominion over all of this earth. Maybe it is that God. Maybe it's the God that we think of when we look at nebulas in space and we see those eyes staring back at us. The God who made the wonders of the universe, this cosmic God. But to be honest, that cosmic God is a little hard to relate for, to for me and maybe also for you. The first person of the Trinity, the one Jesus calls the Father, but whose scripture also calls our dwelling place, and is also the one who makes us, what does that even mean? And so maybe we are supposed to love Jesus. After all, Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. True God from true God, light from light, eternal, begotten, not made, of one essence with the Father. Jesus is the Word made flesh, who was with God and was God in the beginning. Jesus is the one who did not consider equality with God as something to cherish, but instead came to earth in the lowliest form of a servant, a servant who expected no wages for what they were doing. And a servant, an enslaved person, who came here that we might all be raised in glory as he was glorified. And Jesus, in addition to all of these things, speaks into fulfillment the First Testament's teachings and stories about love. We find that Jesus is so gracious. We find that Jesus is so merciful. We find that Jesus extends his love to all who are there to receive it. And indeed, we find that Jesus gathers us to him, calls the children to him, but gathers us like chicks under a hen's wings, like a shepherd caring for his sheep. He teaches us how we should be with one another. I think sometimes that I can love Jesus with my whole being, with all that I am, because he is so good, even if he wouldn't say so himself. I think Jesus is the one whose light I could let shine through me for all generations. I think I could be content with that. I think that I could be shaped into that and be happy all of my days. But then what do we do? about this? What do we do about the cross? I mean, doesn't the cross just show us that none of this really matters? I mean, no matter how good Jesus was, he was still killed. He still died. He lived a good life. He lived well. And none of that saved him from the cross. God, in all of God's goodness, came to this earth and taught us how to love one another, and we couldn't take it. We couldn't hear it. It was too much for us. Jesus asked us to do too much, and so we nailed him to the cross. 
and we let him die. And we stuck him in a tomb with a rock so big that he could never get out. And we left him there on Friday night. And we left him there on Saturday. And we thought, we thought that we would also leave him there on Sunday. But then, God did what God always does. God did the unthinkable. God rose up from the grave and rolled the stone away, and suddenly, a whole new world was possible for us. When Jesus was born, we were reunited with God. Humanity found our place in God again. And then as Jesus grew and taught, he shaped his followers to be the kind of people who could stand before the throne of God as heirs, not subjects. People who were filled with the grace and the mercy and the love that flows in unending rivers from the place where God dwells. And even though we killed him, Jesus rose again, showing us that there is not anything in this world that can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. But then he ascended. So who are we supposed to love now? Are we supposed to to love the Father, the unknowable one, the distant God that is so hard to relate to for so many of us? Are we supposed to love the Son who is no longer with us in the flesh? Aren't we just as abandoned now as we were before Jesus came? Well, of course, we know that we're not. And thank God that we are not. We have the third person of the Trinity, the Spirit, the one who has been here always with us. From the first words that were spoken over creation, in that hovering over the stillness, waiting to come into being, the Spirit has always been there peeking into our stories now and then, hearing the songs that we sing and echoing them with God's own heart. We see the Spirit descending as a dove in Jesus' baptism. We see the fire and the wind at Pentecost. And like a bird, the Spirit has been flying through all of history, throughout all of our stories alighting just for a moment when we are in need before flying off again until we are in need. It is through the Spirit that our hearts and our minds first wake up to God. When we call that grace pervenient grace, the grace that goes before us, the grace that is available to each and every one of us, to turn us toward God. It is the spirit and God's love working within us. And it is the spirit who speaks to us throughout scripture. The one who tells us these precious stories of Jesus, who helps us understand what we need to know that we might be able to receive justifying grace. The grace that pours down on us when we understand that we have been separated from God and we long for permission to come back home to God who has been our dwelling place through generations. The Spirit moves our hearts at the foot of the cross 
helps us to lay down our burdens of sin and grief and raises us back up again through the freedom and power God has given us through Jesus Christ. And the Spirit, too, shapes us in love, shapes us to be more like Jesus, more like God throughout the days of our lives. We call this sanctifying grace, this grace that makes us holy, this grace that makes us more loving, this grace that makes us more like Jesus. Salvation does not begin and end at the cross, as we might think sometimes. Salvation is the work of a lifetime, the work that comes to us through sanctifying grace, through the work of the Spirit in our hearts. And in that way, it is the Spirit living within us, the Spirit dwelling within us, making us God's place, God's dwelling place, a place where the light of God shines out into the world from a home that is completely at one with itself. Maybe it is that God has given us this grace so that we learn how to shine with Christ's own light. God gives us form. Christ gives us the ability to shine, but it is the spirit that lights us up to shine for the world around us. Because the Spirit touches us if we let the Spirit in. The Spirit touches us in every interaction, in every conversation, in all that we see and do, and the Spirit makes it loving, makes it holy, makes it closer to God. The Spirit, if we let the Spirit do good work within us, can make the world come alive for us in the beauty of every growing thing, the beauty of all of creation around us, like this flower. The Spirit, if we let the Spirit, will show us what it means to love God with all you are and to love your neighbor as yourself because really, in this life, our love for God and love for neighbor will look like all of these things. There will be times that we love God by loving creation. We love others by showing them the beauty of creation and showing God's light and God's goodness as it shines through creation. There will be times that our love for God and love for a neighbor will look like taking up our cross and following Jesus. There will be times that we love our God and love our neighbor by just being with our neighbor, by just sitting and hearing and witnessing. And there will be times that we love God and our neighbor and ourselves by just being with God. And there will be times when we, like the Spirit, alight in people's lives, sowing a seed, sowing a kind word, offering the smallest glimmer of the light that is the love of God in all of its depth and height and breadth that is shed abroad in our world and in our hearts. And so the question for us this day and every day, each day that we are blessed to wake up full of the love of God who has always been our dwelling place, and who indeed dwells within us, our question each day is, how will we be shaped? What will we let God do?